give away my password and you all have to copy it. <laughs> <laughs> I keep having to change it at conferences. <laughs> okay. Firstly, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with Agile, and I think Scrum is a brilliant tool, right? So I'm not going to criticize Scrum. Can you hear me? Oh, it's still not up, is it? Uh, I think it was there for us. It was up earlier. Let's try it like this. We may or may not need technical support. This is looking. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Okay. All right. So as I say, there's nothing wrong with Agile, there's nothing wrong with Scrum, provided you realize the context in which they're applicable. Right? Um, one of the characteristics, if you go back to the original Agile Manifesto, and if I go back in my own career, I started off programming in Fortran and COBOL. I still think people should be forced to program on punch cards, because if you get a compile error on card two, it kind of like teaches you discipline, which the current generation of programmers don't have. All right? Um, and I still remember being told if I learned how to use a punch card machine, I'd have a job for life, which is rather what a current educationalists are doing in actually training anybody in school on programming skills, because by the time they graduate, most of what is currently done will be done by AI anyway, and we're not teaching them to understand design and human factors, which is where they're going to be employable. So there's a degree of repetition around this, yeah? But I designed and built decision support systems for people like Guinness PLC, um, that was my programming background, and then moved on into business management. I'm now in my third software startup, but the first which I actually own as opposed to within the company. And I've worked at the sea level, so when people talk about scaling to the sea level, I get rather amused when they're only talking about IT management who want to feel comfortable, rather than the sea level who genuinely need novel solutions. So that's where I want to start to address some of this stuff. And one of the problems we got is if you look at the origins of Agile, um, there's some actually quite, you know, some stuff like DSDM Consortium, some of you may know that. I was one of the three founders of that many years ago when we brought three competitors together to create a new method and standard. Yeah, rather than one small company trying to create a proprietary method. Because we wanted to advance the field. And that introduced concepts like time boxes and rad and jad and things which had been partly neglected by the Agile movement. All, all time boxes don't have to be two weeks. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a three-week time box, and you get some complete nonsense. So I was working with an Australian company. You only get promoted if you're agile. They have waterfall projects, so they're running one-year sprints just so that they can say they're agile. <laughs> and you get that sort of nonsense is increasingly frequent, right? Um, I was chatting about this with Ken Beck the other day, and I said one of the things, with the problems we have is that Scrum took over agile rather than being seen as a tool within agile and people forgot about XP. Now, I normally get cheered by XP people there, so you have to point out one of the reasons is most XP people can't talk with ordinary human beings. <laughs> yeah, and therefore that's kind of like why it didn't work, right? Um, and now we've got a problem because Agile is all about incremental change, allowing solutions to evolve. That's why Agile picked up on things like complexity theory. Because in complexity theory, you can't define a goal and you can't define a structure. You have to do small things in the present and allow something contextually appropriate to emerge. That's kind of like 101 natural science. And what we've now got is this almost schizophrenia between a desire to create highly structured systems basically based on, well, to be quite honest, pyramid selling schemes like SAFE. You know, for my mind, SAFE is the opposite of what Agile is meant to be about because it imposes structure before it does experimentation. Yeah? But it's designed to make people comfortable who can't cope with uncertainty. And rather than start journeys, it seeks to define a goal. And we're starting to get the failures now, but of course the investment has been so high, nobody publicly announces a failure. But if you go and talk, you've got those differences. The main defense of SAFE people now is, well, just do the bits which are appropriate yeah, and we'll abandon some of the stuff. And then we get the Trojan horse argument. It's a good Trojan horse to get Agile accepted. They really should go back and read their Homer, right? Uh, the Trojan horse was based on deep deception, followed by slaughter of the native inhabitants and 30-year wasted journeys by Odysseus, yeah, which he was lucky to survive. So I think, 
know, the Trojan horse argument should be looked at from that perspective. Right? And then, yeah, so I actually think SAFE is actually severely dangerous to the pursuit of Agile. I think it's setting us back three or four decades. And then we get the opposite extreme, which is the mostly harmless but inconsequential things like Management 3.0, or as I call it, Magpoy 3.0, which basically assembles anything and says it's all wonderful if we just get together in two days and we're happy at the end of it, right? Um, kind of like we should start to think about the users being happy rather than the developers being happy and this schizophrenia between excessive order and personal development is a deep problem. Yeah, not saying they, aren't, they haven't got value but we need to move on from that, right? And this slide I use a lot. I mean, I did the Annapurna Sanctuary walk last year and we had really good Sherpas, right? You know, they always sent somebody ahead to make sure the place was hygienic. There was a huge amount of preparation, but there was a body of knowledge. There was two or three hundred years of experience going into what they did. Yeah? Um, well, some of my friends went on a subsequent trek with one of the porters who wanted to be a Sherpa, who'd probably done a two-day course and filled out a multi-choice questionnaire and was now a Sherpa master or something like that. And of course, he didn't know about all of these things, and they actually fell down with food poisoning and altitude sickness and everything else. Because there's a whole body of knowledge we have to apply if we want to move forward. Yeah. Now, part of the reason we got these problems is, let's go on through this, a series of issues, because most methods seem to be drawn from cases. In fact, I've seen agile people say, to hell with the theory, good people just do good things and it works. Well, I've got no problem with that, provided they don't then produce a method and an accreditation scheme based on two projects that they did a few months ago and try and sell it. That's completely different. Yeah? There are major problems with using cases to scale method. Yeah? So just let me run through some of those to make the point. Um, first is we don't recall things the way we do them. If we're successful, we recall things very differently than if we fail. We did controlled tests when I was in IBM. We took outsourcing deems. Outsourcing is a major thing. You either win or you lose. You've spent a huge amount of money. If you fail, you get fired. We did an identical lessons learned progress, a thing called Future Backwards, which is now being used for retrospectives. Forces cognitive load, so it's a very good technique. But we actually did it the day before they knew whether they won the outsourcing contract and the day afterwards. Scripted, identical script, no deviation allowed, you would think everybody was on different planets. Before they knew whether they won or lost, they described things contingently. After they won, they described things as a hero's journey, forgetting all the luck and accidents that happened along the route. And if they failed, it was always somebody else's fault or a lack of resource. Yeah? And this was within 24 hours. Other bodies of work, which I and others have people done, is the way people know things in the field is not the way they describe how they know them even two or three hours later. This is basic science. Yeah? So the minute you start to work with cases, you've got an immediate problem in recall yeah, in terms of what's there. And that's actually quite dangerous. The second thing which comes from this is trusting what people tell you. Uh, we did a whole body of work again in IBM. We went to chief knowledge officers. We interviewed them about their, chief, their programs. We got them to say all the things they did. It was absolutely wonderful. Then we put ethnographers into deep immersion in the companies for three months and discovered there was absolutely no correspondence between what actually happened and what the responsible manager said happened. Yeah? And that's the trouble. You know, when you do cases, you interview the consultant who rolled out the program or the manager who brought them in. Uh, there was one of the great SAFE cases was a senior executive who implemented SAFE claims it was a huge success. Now, if this was true, they'd have been promoted and stayed in the company, but they didn't. They left to become a consultant to implement SAFE. And that, to me, summarizes what it's about, right? Re it, 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 it's not the way it works, right? Uh, fundamentally, we need to be very careful about this because people who have authority or have made financial commitments will find it very difficult to admit that something didn't work. Not only that, people will report to them what they want to hear. This is one of the big problems with leadership. The higher you get up the chain, the more people don't want to tell you things you don't want to hear, and you start to believe it. Yeah? It's also true if all you do is train, you only get people in the initial flush of enthusiasm, you don't get them downstream in terms of the way things work. So that's the problem. Yeah? The next problem, getting the sample right. 
SAFE is based on two or three original cases for the method. You take Lean Startup, that's one of the other popular books. Everybody read Lean Startup? Yeah, hugely enthusiastic. He studies a whole bunch of people who say they were successful. Yeah? He doesn't study anybody who failed. Yeah, we actually did work again in IBM where we studied Silicon Valley and we discovered all the startup companies who failed did all the same things as the companies who succeeded. It's just it was a market and some people are bound to succeed. Yeah? By only taking a positive sample out of a large number, you create prescriptive recipes which have no relationship in fact. And you also, and this is a major problem with Agile, completely ignoring what other people have learned over the years and doing things from scratch. Yeah? Warden College and elsewhere had studied the difference between entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs based on other work which had come before. And there is nothing in Lean Startup which wasn't known better before the book was published, and it's actually quite dangerous. Yeah? And again, this sampling is a major issue because people don't do proper sampling as they move forward. Next one. Inattentional blindness. This is the really scary one. If you give radiologists a set of x-rays, now remember radiologists are working off a body of knowledge, they're deeply trained, they've got 10 or 15 years training, yeah, a body of knowledge which is 50 or 70 years old, and they're looking at a limited amount of information. So you give them a pack of x-rays, on one of the x-rays you hide a picture of a gorilla which is 48 times the size of an average cancer nodule, you ask them to look for anomalies, 82% don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. Yeah? We do not see what we do not expect to see. And that's something I'll address in the next session. The major problem with systems analysis is you're reliant on people interviewing people, which means they only listen to what they expect to listen to. Now, just to tell you the other scary thing, if you conduct more than two interviews, you form a subconscious hypothesis and you literally only hear things which match that hypothesis thereafter. Yeah, now start through the implications of that, not in terms of getting things wrong, but in terms of the opportunities that we are missing, because we don't see things which don't follow previous patterns. That ability to see novelty requires a whole body of changes in practices and processes. Next one, the butterfly effect. Famous cliche, complexity theory and chaos theory, a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazonian rainforest. It's meant to cause a hurricane in Texas. Now, this is not the case. I know Texans. If butterflies were causing hurricanes in Texas, by now they'd have been subject to vigilante action with extreme prejudice involving guns. Right? Um, the point is something very small, uniquely on this occasion, combines with other small things to create a massive effect. It doesn't mean that every time a butterfly flaps its wings, there will be a hurricane. Yeah? The fact that you did a project in a company who already knew you based on work you'd done before and produced something which worked, you can't create an accreditation method based on that. Yeah? Because you haven't got enough data and you haven't got enough diversity within the system to move forward. Next one, the Hawthorne effect. Experiments done in New York State. Now, in the 1920s, they increased in lighting levels in factories and people became more productive. Now, in the modern Agile community, they would now publish a best-selling book called Light, The Secret to Success, <laughs> with an accreditation program on how to switch on, you know, how to use light switches and how to change light bulbs and various things like that. But in those days, they sort of thought they should do some real science, so they actually lowered the lighting levels and people became more productive. Yeah, and what they actually found is that if you do something novel for the first time with good people, it nearly always works. It doesn't mean it will scale. Yeah? And I'm just rolling through a whole body of science here. I'm not going through opinion. This is actually stuff from multiple sources. Then we get the dubious accreditation schemes. Yeah? If you can't accredit somebody on the basis of a two, three, or five-day course, other than to say they attended the course and they did some basics. Um, London taxi drivers, and this is not, you know, actually go through a two-year training process before they're licensed to operate. Their brain and their body have to co-evolve to exercise tasks. And by the way, if you didn't know it, key programming skills require a two- to three-year co-evolutionary process between the body and the brain. It's not just a matter of acquiring something in one way. 
And you can't actually say if you do a five-day course, you are then authorized to run a three-day course, provided you pay a royalty. All right, that is called a pyramid selling scheme. <laughs> and that will discredit Agile completely as the consequences get known. Yeah, IT at the moment is luxuriating in high training budgets. And in a market which forces independent consultants to go through training to get letters after their name in order to come through on LinkedIn searches. That's not sustainable in the long term. And starting to realize it now is going to be critical. But all of that said, to quote the famous Terry Pratchett, he said, I'm paying attention to the stakeholder salesman because I've never seen a rusty snake. Now, I rather like that phrase, right? Uh, what I'm saying is, is not to say there is nothing of value in all of these things, because a lot of them have that, but it's the claims they make and the process they go through and the lack of diversity in the ecosystem which is the problem. And everybody is attempting to create the one true method. Yeah? It's like the word wars with Kanban. Kanban is an absolutely appalling complex systems technique, but it's a very good complicated technique. The concept of work in progress is universal, but the way you represent work in progress in a complex system is by a landscape of potentialities, not a series of structured cards. So we're not looking at the right thing. We're taking something from a manufacturing process which de deals with discrete, ordered, structured things and trying to apply it to an area of high ambiguity where users don't fully what, know what they need and we don't fully know what the technology will do and we need a co-evolution or a co-production phase. So the work in progress concept is valuable, but the attempt to force one representation as a universal method means we lose value all the way through. And that's something I'll talk about in the next session, is how do you represent work in progress within a complex adaptive system. So what I've been doing for the last 14 or 15 years is basically take a natural science-based approach to this. This is what I now do at Bangor University in Wales. We're saying you haven't got in social science and management science, there aren't enough data points to actually produce a hypothesis which can be tested. In real science, you actually observe data, you construct the hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, and then your peer group tests the hypothesis as well. In social science, you do this case studies and you write an explanation which you publish. That's legitimate. It moves the field forward. If you then claim you have a prescriptive method, that's called pseudoscience. It's actually quite interesting. One of the classic examples is it's taught at MIT as, a, as an example of pseudoscience is neurolinguistic programming, NLP. Because what it does, it assembles a whole body of things, some of which have validity, but puts them into a massive structure and then focuses it on accreditation, revenue, and training. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, individual components have validity, but the whole doesn't. Yeah? So actually, kind of like we need to so pay attention to this. So this is what we've been drawing on. Now, what I'm going to do in the last 10 minutes is briefly introduce Kinevin, because that will allow me to talk about a different context. Uh, Kinevin has been picked up quite extensively by the Agile community, and kind of like I tend to let it go. It's kind of like, the, just to be clear on this, Kinevin is an open source framework. Yeah, we do not accredit people in its use, we do not control its use, we're quite interested how people use it. Yeah? And the basic, it's based on the fact that in nature there are three types of system, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. Yeah, and I'm not going to go into that in detail because I say I haven't got the amount of time. So you start in a position, in most organizations, where you don't know what type of system you're in. You don't know whether it's ordered, you don't know whether it's complex, you will know if it's chaotic because you won't be worried about what type of system it is. You'll be trying to survive, all right? I mean, that one is actually quite easy. It's not a natural state. So basically what Kinevin does, and this is the thing people often miss, is that central domain called disorder, yeah, which can be legitimate to enter in order to move into another domain, but it's illegitimate to stay there. So the disorder domain is critical because it's where you start. You need to understand what type of system you're in because you're going to behave differently in different environments. From that, we then move on to two types of order. Now, an ordered system is one with a high constraint, therefore I've got predictability. Therefore, I can actually create a recipe, I can define goals, I can achieve results. Nothing wrong with that. It's interesting, Stacy, whose model used to be using Agile, 
says that nothing is ordered. Yeah, Kinevin actually says human beings have learned how to make things ordered and that's valuable. Yeah. So, for example, in obvious order, the key point here is that the nature of the constraints is visible, the nature of order is visible, everybody can see the relationship between cause and effect and everybody buys into it. So to give us a, a, a nice easy example, in a civilized country, you drive on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> yeah, if you come on the ferry from France over to the UK, then you drive on the left because it makes sense. We could have chosen to drive on the right. Sweden did it in the 1960s. Yeah? Um, they had a referendum on whether they should change from driving on the left to the right, and they all voted to stay driving on the left, but their government had the good sense to ignore the referendum. I'm talking about this a lot at the moment. Yeah, and basically forced them to drive on the right. Once you've made the choice, you go along with it. But it's not absolute, because if a child runs on the road in front of you, you break the rules. Yeah? Um, I worked for IBM for seven years, and I remember when I actually wrote off a car by running into a sheep. I didn't know what it was. I was on a Welsh mountain road, and something ran out in front of me. So I slammed the brakes on, went on black ice, car hit the road, you know, broke up. The first thing they said when I phoned them up is, next time, kill the sheep. <laughs> and, you know, at rigid rule structures, you often have to do really stupid things. Yeah? So kind of like that's one aspect of order. The other aspect of order is it's not self-evident to everybody what the right thing is to do. So you have to bring in expertise or do some sort of analysis. Yeah? Then you can determine the approach, provided you trust the experts involved. Now, those are familiar spaces. The distinction is a key one between best practice and good practice. In best practice, there's only one way to do things. We all buy into it. We might have preferred to drive on the right, but we, everybody else is on the left. We'll go along with it. Now, Italian drivers, by the way, south of Naples, uh, the way you drive there, and this has been studied, they actually flock like birds. It's, it's, it's drive to the center of the flock, match speed, avoid collision. If you actually drive on that basis, it's quite stress-free to actually go on the Sorrento Coastal Road, all right? But if you try and follow the rules of the road, it doesn't work, right? So you have to be aware of the cultural context. But good practice means within, within limits, you can vary what you do, right? So best practice, one right way. Good practice, provided you've got the right training and expertise, you're allowed to vary it within boundaries. But we get predictability, yeah? So kind of like that's order. The trouble is, if we over-constrain the system, we get actual a catastrophic failure. So I say I worked for IBM for seven years. Uh, it was an interesting experience. They took the company over. We didn't volunteer. We were conscripted. And the first thing they did was to charge us for coffee and ban alcohol. Now, <laughs> we were a software development company, all right? The, the, the coffee-alcohol cycle was a critical part of customer satisfaction. <laughs> Nobody should be expected to speak to users without alcohol as, as part of the process. <laughs> you then had to have coffee to sober up, and then you need alcohol when the users don't want what they actually said they wanted when you give it to them because they discover something else is there. Either way, we overcame that. We held meetings in, in off-site meeting rooms which would give us an invoice for accommodation but wouldn't mention the alcohol and the coffee, all right? So there ways around that. Then they banned food for staff. Now, this time, I'm a C-level executive, all right? That means I only meet customers when they're angry. <laughs> yeah, do not get promoted this level, right? You never, ever meet a happy customer because nobody will let you see them because they're enjoying it too much and you can't be part of that, all right? So you only get them. So. And we'd learned by now, you didn't argue with IBM on the basis of logic or reason. Yeah, that didn't work. The only thing which did work was a Socratic technique to ask them questions until they contradicted themselves, and that's a scary technique. It generally results in you having to drink poison at some stage down the track, again, if you know your history. So we said, okay, it's four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I've been called in. This was a real case. We got, you know, Mercury's 999 system, which has to go live at nine o'clock in the morning. I've got three systems programmers in a VAX cluster, which is just going bust, and all I can do to keep them awake is buy pizza and Coke. What do I do? And they looked really worried, and I realized they could have got it wrong. And I said, I do mean the drink, just to be clear. <laughs> there was a sigh of relief at that point. And then they actually made up a rule on the spot, and they said, well, okay, you can do that, but you need to get vice presidential approval 48 hours in advance. 
Now, at this point, you have to resist the temptation, and we say, well, okay, that's a really good idea. We would never have thought of that. This is one of the major benefits of joining IBM. Uh, discover they didn't understand irony, so we could turn it on and off with HTML code in parallel chats during conference calls. We said, what happens on the extremely rare occasion where we don't get 48 hours notice of a crisis? And they said, country general manager approval after the event. But if you work for IBM, that means you know your expenses will disappear. They'll never be signed. If you complain, your name will appear on the wrong sorts of lists. So the practice emerged of over-tipping London taxi drivers, which means you get a blank receipt. The blank receipts were filled out for the cost of the pizza and Coke. A parallel set of books were kept, and the responsible manager took a bus and claimed the taxi fare. This is 20 years ago. I was at the Scrum Alliance conference in Berlin a couple of years ago. Three people from IBM ran up to me afterwards and said, we're still doing that. Did you invent it? <laughs> and in Dubai four weeks ago, somebody from IBM came up and opened his wallet and said, look, I've got all the blank receipts. We're still doing it. <laughs> if you over-constrain a system which can't be naturally constrained, people have to break the rules to get the job done. Yeah, and that actually is catastrophic, because then, since you're right, it's an over-constrained system, which is one of the points I was making earlier. And then we have a complex adaptive system, which is one, effectively, where there isn't a... There, there's a complex system is dispositional, not causal. It means I can define the present, and I can identify pathways, but I can't define goals. Now, that's actually important. If you define goals in a complex adaptive system, you miss opportunities that you could discover on a journey. Yeah? So, the well, key thing, and I say we'll do this in the second session, is how do you map the dispositional state of the system in terms of user needs, programmer's culture, employee culture, market needs? You need to map them as dispositional states and change in the present and respond quickly as things change. Yeah? Now, that's where most programming goes. The thing I want to finish on is the thing people tend to forget in Kinevin, which is actually there are two typologies, and if you don't know the difference between a typology and a taxonomy, go and look it up. Uh, taxonomy rhymes with taxidermy in English and has a similar impact, all right? Uh, the, the typology works in different ways. <laughs> now, within Kinevin, there are four key dynamics. This one is the stable dynamic. So you're in a complex space, you can't define a goal, you have to do parallel safe-to-fail experiments to discover what's possible. Here there's a whole body of new techniques we've been developing, which are called pre-scrum techniques in Agile. Things you do before you go into Scrum to experiment more broadly. Now, bringing back in a lot of stuff around pair and triple programming, a lot of stuff around deliberate mutation in user requirements. You want more variety in the system to discover what's possible. Once you've got a degree of stability on that, you move it into Scrum. Scrum's brilliance, and it's one of the best techniques I've discovered, is its ability to make things on the boundary of complexity complicated so they can be executed. It's a complex to complicated transition tool because it does a linear iteration to get things right. Yeah? So that's actually its value. What everybody forgets to do is to test whether it's still working six months later, one year later, 18 months later. And actually, if you do that test and it's not producing the same results, then you need to cycle back. There's a natural cadence on this, yeah? yeah you can go very fast or very slow. I've had two near-fatal accidents on bicycles. Uh, once was trying to ride very, very slowly to avoid putting my foot on the ground on a Boris bike into Trafalgar Square and the bike toppled over, and I ended up studying the tire treads of a London bus at intimate level, and luckily I stopped, all right? The other was 25 years before on a, you know, on a brand new bike just made for me where I forgot to decouple a couple of brakes up properly, and I celebrated getting to the top of a hill with three pints of beer, and it was kind of like, shall we say, an interesting experience on the way down, all right? <laughs> yeah, going too fast or going too slow is a mistake. You have to work out what the cadence is. And the trouble is, people often see the outcome of a Scrum process as, that's it, we've done it. They don't build in the validation and test and move back. In fact, there's a whole body of work we're starting to work on now on rethinking systems architecture from a complexity point of view. Because systems architecture, she seems to be confined to people who believe TOGAF is the way, the truth, and the light. 
and people who think they've got an alternative to TOGAF, but every time I look at it, it looks just like TOGAF. It's just a different set of boxes with a different set of arrows, right? So the architecture becomes important at this point. If you don't do that, you're going to have to do what's called a shallow dive into chaos. You're going to have to reset the system. It may be a deep dive. A lot of people who in, implemented EIP systems 20 years ago are now discovering that the market is changing faster than the ability to upgrade the software. And a lot of us warned of that at the time. You know, in, a, in a highly working environment, anything with an upgrade path of more than six months is actually quite scary. And you're better taking the cost of multiple components with interfaces, but then at least you can swap things in or out. Yeah, so the danger of this is high because you may not get a chance to recover. A small amount of material goes down there. And I'll just say, this is one of the other major problems with the focus on accreditation. Accreditation requires people to produce manuals and structure, which moves down into this space, which means it doesn't adapt. Or you end up with new releases every two months, which kind of like indicates you didn't think it through properly in the first place. So again, you can make your own references on that um, without too much difficulty. Right? Um, when things go down there, they go down there to die. They may be 90% of your organization's value. This isn't a statement about value. It means that you don't need to change them so you can stabilize them. Yeah, you might object wrapper a legacy code, but it's stable. Increasingly these days, and this is the new dynamic, and with this I want to finish, is we're dealing with software which never, ever stabilizes for long. Yeah. Now that actually is how the internet works. It's how social computing works. Multiple fragmented things which interoperate in which applications are emergent properties of the interaction of people, software, and hardware over time. Now, we're not translating that real-world experience with the theory which lies behind it into the methods and tools for Agile, even though the philosophy of Agile actually is all about that. It's all about multiple different things, interacting, experimentation, fluidity, people working in teams, accepting uncertainty. It's not about rigid structure. It's not about rigid methods. It's not about accreditation. It's not about a focus entirely on royalties from accreditation and training revenue. There's more money made in Agile in training and accreditation than in delivering software code. Yeah, and we need to think about that because that's where people focus. Okay? Now, say, I'm going to talk about some of that later, but the key thing, the key thing I think we all need to be looking at is this. Users don't know what technology can do. So how do we create ecosystems in which the capabilities of technology interact with unarticulated needs to give people advantage? If you want to scale to the sea level, you don't scale by actually doing what they pay you to do better. You scale by giving them things they didn't know they needed, which give them strategic advantage. And structured approaches will not achieve that. Thank you very much for your time.